Hello. Hey, Marvin, how are you? I'm good. How are you? You looking fancy. Well, thank you. I, I'm glad <laughs> I don't look like what I've been through, as they say. <laughs> hey. <laughs> well, listen, I am outside because I, I, we were on a beach trip today because it's, it's 107 degrees in Portland. And my family said, we got to go to the beach. And I said, well, oh I'll God. go, but I'm going to have to leave and go do this interview somewhere. So I'm at a restaurant trying to do the interview, and the only seat I could get was outside. So, Oh, wow. That's why, yes, that's what why I got beach? my shades. And... What beach are y'all at? Cannon Beach. Oh, yeah. The Oregon coast Cannon is beach. so beautiful. Yeah. Well, that's nice. So yeah, a, yeah, a couple but... things, as we've talked about, this is a... Uh, the moment that we're in is actually really helpful for our project this kind of, that we're working on right now. Uh, the second edition of the Handbook of Critical Race Theory and Education. We couldn't have asked for better PR, right? <laughs> yes, we're in the show. Apparently, everyone can see and hear us. Yes. Is what the sign here said. Yeah, we're live. We yeah. are live. Did you hear uh, Dr. Gloria Latson Billings' uh, NPR interview? I did. It was awesome. It was awesome. It was incredible. Uh, yeah. 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 So this is an interesting moment for um, for us, for the work, for the country. But for those of us who do critical race theory, it's really interesting. I was listening to an, another interview about McCarthyism and how, um, you know, just how devastating it was for everyone because um, you could ju just the specter of being um, described as uh, un-American was devastating for a number of people. Um, clearly, I mean, it ruined people's lives and uh, and that was the intention, right? To shut down any perspective that wasn't um, uh, deemed appropriate by McCarthy and those that supported him. Um, and so I feel like we're back in this moment now where, you know, any kind of discussion of difference, or racism or inequality is deemed as inappropriate and, uh, and un-American. And uh, it's, you know, we've done our share of interviews and I, what I try to emphasize is that this is, you know, it, this is fascism. Um, and once we begin to tell people what they can't know, what they can't think, what they can't say, what they can't ask, ask questions about, you know, we are really, um, we, we are, we are in the full throes of, of a fascist, um, fascist state. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, kind of move that way with, with our silence, it seems. Uh -oh. I think you're right. And I'm, I'm excited that uh, you are here with me to have this conversation because uh, I think your perspective is so important. Um, you know, we've been talking about and studying race for for a long time in America. Uh, you know, Frederick Douglass, <laughs> Sojourner Truth. I mean, right? I mean, before America was America, uh, black folks had been talking about race. Uh, and I think, as Andre Perry recently said in, in an article he published on one of the news mags, you know, as long as there is racism, there's going to be the study of race and racism, and we're going to be talking about white supremacy. And so, uh, you know, he says, if, if you want us to stop talking about it, then then stop being racist. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so there's the solution right there. I think I just found the answer. Andre Perry gave it to us that, you know, we, we can stop talking about race as long as we... Andre Perry? <laughs> 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 That's the answer, but okay. <laughs> No, he's not. But but that's the point: is that as long as there's racism in America, there will be there will be deep study of race and racism in America, which is what critical race theorists have been doing. And uh, I love the conversation that folks are having is really not about critical race theory at all. Uh, I talked about uh, this gentleman, Christopher Rufo, who works for the Manhattan Institute, who very intentionally. Uh, decided to use critical race theory as a moniker for everything related to social justice, equity, gender, sexuality, right? Anything that has to do with, with equity in schools and in, in education, Christopher is referring to as critical race theory. And that was very intentional. 
Uh, yeah. It was he, he had no understanding whatsoever of what critical race theory actually is. And so our discussions and our debates within the field about the nature of race and racism are really not what's happening in places like Loudoun County, Virginia, where there's this uproar from parents about the use of critical race theory in schools. I saw a very uh, unfortunate video of an African-American man and his daughter. And he said that his daughter had seen a video uh, of a, uh, a, a, a sign that said blacks and whites. Uh, and it was, it was an image of, that reminded his daughter of a period that she knew nothing about. So he had not taught daughter about our history of segregation in America. And when she saw the sign in the video at school, she came home and she asked her father, what is that? And he was angry because he did not want to teach his black child about the history of segregation in America. And so he was on Fox News saying no critical race theory in the schools. Well, first of all, that wasn't critical race theory. But secondly, why aren't you teaching your daughter her history? And, and what does that have to do with me? <laughs> So there's just a lot of confusion out there about, about what critical race theory is and what it's not. And a lot of it is, is people being in denial and running away from uh, the truth of our history as Americans. So maybe we would be helpful if we talk about kind of what critical race theory is, the history of it. it it's been recited. I mean, I, I tell people, if you read any article in education, the history of critical race theory is the kind of opening um, uh, the opening of every um, of every article where folks are talking about um, critical race theory uh, in education. And so we kind of recite that genealogy uh, repeatedly. Um, and so we should not be confused about what critical race theory is and where it emanates. Um, so we know that it started in um, legal uh, scholarship um, and uh, Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, Richard Delgado, Kendall Thomas, Gary Peller, um, Neil Gotanda, Patricia J. Williams, Charles um, Charles Lawrence, Mari Matsuda. Um, it was you know there um, there are a number of scholars: Dorothy Roberts, Regina Austin, uh, many who contributed. I'm leaving names out, but I, I'm trying to remember the ones that immediately are uh, kind of a you know, the group of scholars who came together to think about why um, why they saw a persistence of um, uh, discrimination and inequality uh, in certain domains, even when we had, um, um, when we had legislation that essentially outlawed racial discrimination in employment, in housing, in school admissions, um, so that there we shouldn't have seen, you know, um, disparities um, across those domains, and yet um, we saw them, right? Um, and so they wanted to understand this as more than just um, uh, a an issue of um, the lack of pipeline or the lack of preparedness um, on the part of people of color, but that there was some intentionality. Um, and that the the law actually was complicit in the uh, persistence of discrimination and um, racial inequality. And so that's what they set out to do in critical race theory in education, as you know, uh, Gloria Letson Billings, Bill Tate, Danny Salarzano, Larry Parker, um, all, you know, uh, were interested in kind of similar issues in education, how we have persistence of racial inequality in education um, after, you know, in light of the Brown decision and the Lau decisions um, and um, uh, interventions in uh, curriculum and multicultural education, why are we seeing these disparities in, in achievement and educational outcomes? And so could it be more than just, again, race as a variable, because as the variable, it shows up that certain groups were persistently um, underrepresented in some things and overrepresented in others. And so was it more to it than just race operating as a variable? Um, was it perhaps a, um, a more of a contributor than we had thought about before in ways that were ideological and not necessarily 
um, phenotypical. Um, just by virtue of being Black, you will have these, but is there something else at play that shows up in policy and practice? And so that's kind of where we are education. And as, you know, kind of second generation scholars, you and I, um, you haven't been trained by Danny Salarzano and me by Gloria and Bill, is that we have, you know, tried to, again, kind of use this lens of CRT to understand the persistence of racial um, disparities um, in educational domains, in teacher training, in, um, in school discipline, uh, in policy, so uh, across a number of domains. Um, I don't know, is there anything else you want to add about the kind of the history of CRT and what it is um, in education? Well, no, I, I, think, I think you captured it really well. You know, um, I decided I would, I would bring out a couple of key texts today, <laughs> critical race theory, uh, the key writings that form the movement is, is really like our Bible, right? It, uh, and, and all of us, I see Adrian's got hers, and, and they're all tattered up. And this is uh, what we were all first introduced to uh, back in uh, you know, 96, 97, and, and uh, in 98 and so on. And so this, uh, the introduction to this captures exactly what you said uh, in terms of critical race theory. You know, they say here in the introduction that is to understand how a regime of white supremacy and its uh, and its subordination of people of color have been created and maintained in America. So it's it's about understanding uh, white supremacy, how it was developed, how it was created, and how it's maintained, right? And what are the tools through which it is maintained? Chiefly through the law. And so legal scholars enter the conversation um, through studying, critiquing the law and the limitations of the law and the way the law has uh, failed, particularly African-Americans. And they go way back to slavery and beyond. And you can look at a series of, of court cases, right? Uh, and, and this, uh, chiefly Plessy versus Ferguson and others um, that and, and the way in which they have failed us. Um, and because they, they say here, they talk about how we examine the relationship between the social structure and the professed ideals like democracy and freedom, right? Uh, and the rule of law and equal protection. Well, who has equal protection? We certainly do not, although the law suggests that we do. Uh, and again, what, what they're doing is essentially showing and that. The other really important thing I think that you mentioned and talked about here is uh, this idea of meritocracy, this idea of objectivity, right? We talk about scholarship, we talk about the law as objective, we talk about our scholarship as objective, and they reject that. They say that all of this stuff is, is uh, biased in some way. Uh, and they would argue as critical race theorists that it is, um, it is racially biased toward uh, white folks uh, against us you know, and, and, and devalues us at, in every way. Uh, the other thing that they talk about uh, that I think is really important uh, that you raise is this idea of creating an oppositional standpoint, right? Uh, um, developing a voice or perspective that uh, counters the majoritarian story or, the, or, or what we say, sort of, sort of the overarching white narrative uh, of, of who we are, how the world works and so on. And so critical race theory gives us a perspective, gives us a lens through which to tell our story uh, that really, it, it sees us as not only the storyteller, but as the, the, the sort of producer, the, the person who uh, constructs the story, uh, really for the purposes of lifting up um, our, our, our community in, in positive ways. And I think, you know, as you were saying, education scholars have really tried to uh, adopt that approach um, in, through lots of different uh, lenses. You know, the Handbook of Critical Race uh, Theory in Education uh, we have the second edition, as you said, coming out in October. Yay, we're excited about that. <laughs> we're moving from 28 chapters to 32 chapters, and we've got a whole bunch of brand new scholars who are, who are introduce, introducing some fabulous new uh, uh, concepts and ideas. Dr. Dixon, you can talk about the new article that you and your colleagues have written that I think really takes intersectionality to a whole new place, right? Uh, we have a, a, a new chapter in that book that talks about uh, discrit and how uh, well, black and brown folks who are disabled 
are, are, are criminalized and policed in schools. And they, and they compare that to what happens to George Floyd and others who were killed uh, needlessly by police. And so I think this, this new handbook is right on time, uh, given the, the need for education around race uh, in America today. Yeah, I'm really excited about, um, I'm excited about the book. I'm excited to keep doing the work. And, you know, it's interesting. One of my um, doctoral students or former doctoral students, he's a new assistant professor um, at a university in the South, uh, in the Southwest. And uh, this is his first year. Um, and he, uh, a senior colleague came to him and asked him uh, if to teach the CRT class because she, you know, she wanted to do some other things next year, and uh, they work in a place. I, I mean, there you can, you know, right? This throw it uh, a dart, and you're going to hit a place that is attacking CRT. Um, but I thought it was, and I and I explained to him that this is, you know, this is sadly you are seeing how the academy in some places pick up um, what they think are kind of hot and sexy um, uh, lines of inquiry um, or theoretical frameworks for the accolades. And then when the heat comes or when the interest wanes, then they move on. And that it was, I thought, you know, uh, it, it should tell him the kind of quality of colleague he has um, that a someone with tenure would wanna pass off this kind of hot potato to a an untenured um, an untenured uh, colleague and 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 not that you know if, if you you know and we we you know we started our careers in critical race theory um, so I'm not I wouldn't suggest that an untenured uh, assistant professor not do critical race theory and that you wait until you have tenure but that it was um, it was a an it was a gesture of bad will <laughs> that in this climate, um, a, a tenured colleague would, uh, you know, uh, uh, absolve themselves of the responsibility in an area that they had dominated and did not want to give over the class actually to the to my to my student in his first year. But now that it is uh, wildly unpopular, um, that oh, what you know, go ahead and take a stab at it. You know, I, I, I'm concerned about that, but it illustrates again, that the kind of the way that critical race theory has lived in the academy. So it's really stunning um, that there's this, you know, this mythology that school districts are teaching, you know, kids K-12 critical race theory when it hasn't necessarily been operationalized as a full-fledged curriculum. I mean, you know, you and I know that there are very few courses taught in higher ed on critical race theory. Even in law schools, a lot of law schools don't necessarily teach it as a required course. It's a, in, in law schools, it's often a, an elective. Similarly, in graduate school, in schools of education, um, and we have colleagues, but it's a, it's a relatively, you know, kind of under, um, under not understudy, but certainly isn't as, um, widespread in schools and colleges of education. Certainly teachers aren't being trained to be critical race teachers or principals aren't being trained to be critical race principals and there aren't critical race theory, you know, curricula. There are isolated places that have, and one that we know of right in Tucson um, where a colleague attempted to try to think critically about race in the area um, and then the whole entire state legislature banned ethnic studies and they conflated ethnic studies with critical race theory yet again. Um, and how long ago was that, Marvin? That was when we were doing our first handbook, right? When Augie was going through. Yeah, that was somewhere 2013, 2014. He has, a, he has a chapter in the handbook where he talks a little bit about that. And he talks about how he was trying to use critical race theory in, in, in the high school classroom to do some things. But as you say, uh, not only did he get, did he, did he get, did he get banned in the high school, it got banned across the whole state. Oh, and, whole state. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think some of that was, was undone, uh, but 
never yeah. nevertheless uh it, it was a really uh, awful time for him and he does have a chapter in the handbook where he tries to describe a little bit some of the some of the pedagogy he was drawing on uh, dead prez who are uh hip-hop artists critical hip-hop artists um, who are uh you know talking about some of the issues around swing of black and brown kids and he used that as a subtext for telling a story about the experience in tucson arizona but as you say I think he was probably the only person in the country doing that. <laughs> that yeah. th this is not widespread. Yet. Yeah. And, and, and outside of uh, UCLA. Who, who, right. There, and there, there isn't a CRT curriculum that's a K-12 curriculum. I mean, it, in some ways it is um, contradictory to the theory that one would create a kind of critical race um, curriculum and that it's you know it might inform someone's perspective on teaching and curriculum but it certainly doesn't function as a as a you know curriculum itself so so it's really interesting that that they've created this kind of um they've created this boogeyman this educational boogeyman that i think is really a distraction from obviously as you i, mean, I think it's a distraction from the other things that they uh that they being republicans are are trying to do to, to disenfranchise um, people of color. And so um, it, Absolutely. you know, we could have predicted this moment, right? Um, and uh, and so if it, you know, if it's an is a critical race theory, it will be something else. But there there was a, you know, I think it's a distraction to the other ways that we're being disenfranchised. Oh yes, and it was very intentional, right? That the use of critical race theory was a way to, to, it's a moniker for a whole bunch of things that have nothing to do with critical race theory or maybe related to critical race theory. Like critical pedagogy is related to critical race theory in some, in some important ways in terms of thinking about being critical of social injustice and, thing, and thinking about how we engage the oppressed and those kinds of things. So there are definitely commonalities, but the, uh, th they're different things. Uh, and um, so I, this is very intentional. You know, what I, what I have been reading and I've been interested in this, this whole issue quite a bit is that really it, it's an effort on the part of uh, the, the Trump uh, folks to get him back in power uh, and to, as you say, distract us, but also to find an issue that would scare the bejeebus out of white middle-class America, right? Uh, if, if you scare white middle-class folks enough, you can get them to do just about anything, is, is what they think, right? And so what, I, what, what I'm reading is that uh, you know, my white suburban middle class women are completely freaked out about this idea of critical race theory being taught in the schools. And so it is leading people to behave politically in ways that would serve um, Trump and his ilk uh, is, is, is what's going on. The other issue is that um, Biden and Harris have been so successful so far with their policy agenda that the Republicans don't really have uh, anything to respond with other than to drum up fear uh, and to get people, you know, talking and running scared. Uh, so, so, and there's a long tradition, right? You can go back to Nixon. I mean, people compare Nixon to Trump all the time, but remember, you know, Nixon used racial fear and anxiety to get people to swing his way, so to speak, um, and to vote for him. And then we see how that turned out. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, we, we keep reliving these political historical nightmares over and over and over again. And, and now it's, as you say, uh, critical race theory happens to be the boogeyman when it's fact people aren't talking about critical race theory at all. And you know, Reagan did the same thing, the same, you know, the tropes, um, the, the uh, welfare mom and Willie Horton and, um, and the, you know, there's the famous line that, um, that Reagan had when he was starting to um, dismantle the Office of Civil Rights and to, you know, heat this whole notion of intent, proving intent in discrimination cases was, it is a, a, an artifact of, Ronald, of the Ronald Reagan era. He inserted that as a point of um, proof that, that one would have to have if you're going to make, file a, a, a discrimination case, that you had to prove that there was intent. But the other thing that, that Reagan said is, um, you know, he was not happy with what he described as special interest groups. And this, some of you had 
disability, so special education, you had Title IX, um, that was in the 70s, um, the bilingual education, all of these things that came out of the 70s, he, his line was, perhaps we did too much too soon. And the Nation at Risk report was their quote unquote evidence that the US had kind of sort of, we had lost some footing, not taking into consideration that Sputnik happened, you know, <laughs> Sputnik happened, you know, 20, 30 years earlier. And so what footing did we quote unquote lose? Because we've been chasing after this kind of edge since Sputnik. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting line, but he, he tied this, these, um, the, this, this, um, these pushes for equity and inclusion as somehow the cause of some watering down of the American curriculum and the, that we had kind of lost footing against our um, international uh, peers using the, the PISA scores and all of that when, I mean, and that's been debunked, you know, we don't even test the same groups of people and they don't educate people similarly. So, um, uh, so that was a misnomer, but it was a great talking point, right? And you have the kind of, then we have the kind of beginnings of the culture war with the Edie Hirsch books um, that were, you know, he made him a millionaire, what people need to know that very narrowly tailored what counted as a credible um, and useful knowledge um, for, you know, for our, our folks. And so that kind of put us on this road to national standards that were, you know, that were in many ways scrubbed of any kind of critical thought about citizenship, about rights, about race, um, and so on, and 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 here then here comes you know that was in the early '80s. Here we are um, with critical race theory. So you think about Reagan and the Nation at Risk in '84. The critical race theory folks um, met in '88 or '89 at um, University of Wisconsin, I think, to kind of talk about this kind of burgeoning. How do we think more critically about race and law? Um, and so all of these things kind of happen similarly and cyclically, right? So you have Reagan with his rollbacks on civil rights laws, on um, educational equity, and um, and now here we are again with, you know, a similar, you know, situation. And Reagan, you know, trying to implement the, his trickle-down economics where there are huge tax cuts to the wealth, which helped create you know the kind of situ the situation that we're in now with with wealth disparities, um, and under investing in a public infrastructure, redirecting public funds to private entities, um, and you know we're fully in that moment now, and and we're you know we're kind of back where we were um, in the '80s, where we were with with uh, Nixon in the '70s, so. Um, so it is, you know, we follow these kind of similar patterns around where race gets to be thrown out, race and equity, and people of color get sacrificed at the altar of um, performance. You, know, you just reminded me of the, uh, of the, of the conversation or, the, or great debate between, um, I don't know if you remember, remember this, Molepi Asante and Arthur Schlesinger. <laughs> and, and, you know, you're so right. There was this late 80s, 90s, uh, you know, conversation around uh, whether or not teaching Afrocentricity or, you know, the, the black people focusing in on black culture and trying to understand its, its origins and, and seeing it as something positive and healthy, that that was somehow uh, e e equal to the disuniting of America, right? Um, you know, Bloom and, and Schlesinger and people like that. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, and so there's always been this this sense that when we talk critically about race, or even in a loving way about ourselves, that we are somehow uh, uh, separating ourselves from, from other people, or we are somehow disuniting or tearing apart uh, the country. That it's it's divisive to speak positively about blackness, right? <laughs> it is it is a divisive and evil evil thing to to talk and speak critically about the the horrible history of racism and white supremacy in America. And you and I are scholars and we've studied this stuff for 20, 30 years. Uh, and, and there's still so much we do not know about slavery in the United States of America. Like I did not know up until about five years ago that, that African babies were used as 
uh, uh, bait for alligators in Florida so that white men could make uh, alligator shoes, right? I knew about the lynchings. I knew about the, the, the way people would be treated. But there's so many different aspects of our history and our story. There's, I mean, it, it is really a, a, a nightmare. You know, when I, I, I think about what we what I learned in church about sort of, um, you know, it was something I think you were saying earlier, I don't look like what I've been through. And, and, and just how far we have come through all of this um, despite uh, how we've been treated. I think it really is a fascinating and wonderful story. And for anybody to say that that we have to somehow uh, repress it or, or, or not talk about it or not look at it critically, really is, is speaking out of fear. And I think yeah. we have to push back on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was um, watching, a Tara, I was following, I follow Tara Hunter, who's a historian. And, um, Oh, was it Tara Hunter? It may not have been. It might have been Blair Kelly, who's another historian. Um, but at either rate, either one of them tweeted about the concern of what the three fifths meant. So people interpret that the, the Africans were counted, enslaved Africans were were counted as three fifths of a person, and they argue that that shows a lack of humanity that 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 the um, that American enslavers didn't see. Africans as humans by calling them three fifths of a person. And she was like, no, this was about ownership and capital and wealth. So three fifths of some, it, it, this was to uh, allow you to accumulate more wealth. So it was not about humanity because they didn't see us as humans. They saw us as capital, right? As, as an, as an asset. And so, um, and so don't, you know, and I, and my response was, here we go, you know, capitalism. This was a, this, you know, we can't forget the kind of foundation of the U.S. as a capitalist, and that was intentional, right? Even down to the counting of your assets that you don't see as you didn't see them as people. They weren't treated as as full humans. They were treated as as they were property, and um, and how you use property and manipulate it and um, use it for, you know, again, the accumulation of wealth. So to, to kind of remember that. And, and I know you and I have been asked a lot about kind of the conflation of critical race theory with Marxism. And one thing I want to say, though, Derek Bell had a critique of capitalism. Um, and it would be along this lines that he, it's, I think it was Blair, Blair, Blair Kelly and not um, uh, Tara Hunter, that, you know, to again, remember the um, that uh, how, how fundamental wealth building and wealth accumulation and wealth protection was to the framers of the constitution, um, which is why the franchise was tied to property and to ownership. It wasn't just one man, one vote for everybody. That had to be an amendment, right? People had to agitate for that. That wasn't an amendment. That wasn't right off the top. Off the top was what if you own property, you can vote. If you don't own property, you can't vote. And who would never own property? Women were never going to own property. Enslaved Africans were never going to own property. Um, indigenous people were never going to own. They were being dispossessed of their property, right? Um, in the the land that was appropriated from what is now, you know, in Mexico, they would never. There was never the franchise was never going to be offered to those groups because they weren't seen as um, as appropriate for the franchise. White male property owners, even poor white men, weren't didn't have you know uh, the franchise. So we can't forget the again the the strong ties between capital ownership. Um, land rights, land ownership, and um, what it means to be a citizen in the U.S. And if that is a, a Marxist, if that makes CRT Marxist, then, you know, I guess so. I mean, if you have, you know, if any kind of class critique or economic critique makes one a Marxist, then, you know, okay. <laughs> it, yeah. It, yeah, I agree. I think the relationship between property and, and whiteness, I mean, it's all intertwined. I think you could also make the argument that, that gender is an important aspect. You pointed to uh, how, how white women, women's rights were were repressed. Right. And so I think you could make a, you can make an analysis around race, class, gender. 
you could look at look at sexuality and a whole range of different areas. And I think all of those would be would be relevant. What I want to say though about um, the the property issue and and how important that was to um, you know uh, land ownership and to the rights of people in this in the in the country. Christine Sleater um, has a fictional book that she wrote that kind of sort of tells her own experience, right? And she goes back in, into her own history and she, she talks about her uh, ancestors being, um, uh, you know, the man how manifest destiny really uh, set them up for great wealth, right? That if you were white and you didn't have to be particularly wealthy, but you had to have the means, and if you had to be male, to get to California or Oregon or some other uh, previously unclaimed destination. And in this state where I live right now in Oregon, for example, you would be awarded, you know, 50 acres of land. And in some cases, um, cows and other animals and other things to work uh, on a farm, right? Just because of your skin color, right? And your gender. Um, now, again, the people who were, had the ability to do this tended to have wealth, but not all of them, right? And so uh, for white folks, there was a way in which, and I think Cheryl Property talks, I mean, Cheryl uh, uh, Harris talks about this, um, that the, the, the whiteness in terms of its, its, its skin color had such value and you could accrue, right? Um, value in terms of money and resources and land simply because of that. Uh, and at the same time, uh, if, you know, if you're going to give away 50 acres of land to one person, then you're taking it away from somebody else. And so you, you had the natives who were removed. They were essentially annihilated and exterminated and, and, and shifted to other parts of, of these states and so on uh, as, as white men were being. But, but it, I guess my point is that the playing field opened up quite a bit for white folk, right? Uh, and so it wasn't so much about how wealthy they were, it's that what the, what was required was white skin, right? And we still see that um, playing out today. Yeah. Um, so I I guess one other thing I would want us to kind of think about um, is to um, if you were to give advice to um, teachers or school leaders who are in cities now where, where parents are coming to school board meetings and railing against critical race theory and demanding that um, they not teach critical race theory, you know, there's some um, school districts that are facing um, backlash about even the professional development that teachers get that it not includes critical race theory. What would you, what, what can we, you know, how can we support schools in this climate? We go from one, you know, just literally months earlier, maybe last year, where, um, you know, we're all saying teachers need to prepare, be prepared uh, to teach um, kids uh, across a range of difference and you know, why these workshops are important to now, you know, if you have workshops, they can't ever talk about this. Like if you were, you know, if you were talking to a school leader, what would, what advice would you give him or her? Well, I, I or recently they? ran for, yeah, I, I recently ran for uh, and was elected to my local school board in the town where I live. Yes. <laughs> where in Tiger? Yeah, you Tiger know. policy, yes. Yeah. You yeah, know, my, Wall my term Wall begins. Uh, uh, Tiger Twalton is, you know, it's it's combined. Oh, I um, didn't know that. Oh. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a couple of days, I will be uh, sworn in um, uh, as a school board member. Um, Fancy. And, and for me, and for me, that was really about uh, trying to ensure that that superintendent and that district could continue to do important equity work, right? That there are people in my community, unfortunately, and fortunately for me, it's not a majority of folks in my community, but there are some who would rather see uh, all of that eliminated from the curriculum. Uh, they don't—they don't want to be made to feel uncomfortable because they don't want to be reminded of, of America's history, uh, and so on. And they wanted the curr curriculum to be very narrow uh, and and focused on just a few issues. Right. And so we have a superintendent 
and uh, a board uh, that is thinking about that a little differently and that is really trying to focus on equity. And I see it as part of my role to, to try to support that. So I would say, you know, support your school board, join your school board. Uh, um, uh, there's a professor at, at Michigan State that I spoke to, Tara Ch uh, Ch Benz yeah. Benz Chamber, who is, is school board president, um, really well-known, well-regarded um, uh, scholar. And uh, so she, I think, is, is serves as a, as a model for many of us. Uh, another person, Susan Lynn, I think I met. Um, so there are a number of us who are, you know, scholars in the field and who are serving on school boards for the purposes of trying to really support them to be able to do this work at a high level. Um, and uh, so I, I would say that. I would say also, you know, uh, I have offered to do uh, professional development sessions, um, training, um, uh, d discussions, uh, you know, book, book talks or whatever uh, with teachers, with educators, with school leaders. Uh, and in my state, you know, if people ask me to do that, I don't, I don't charge them for that. Uh, so, uh, you know, if we, we, if we can be available, I've done um, the same thing with student groups. You know, you, there are ways to talk about race with children that's appropriate. Um, I heard about a, 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 a lesson where some teacher divided first graders up into uh, oppressor class and oppressed class. <laughs> maybe, right, I know, uh, trying to maybe do what Jane Elliott did with adults, right? But, it, it, you know, no, you can't, you can't do that with six, seven year olds and kids end up crying and upset and you have a mess. Uh, and so you have to be thoughtful about, you know, uh, what's developmentally appropriate when you're working with children. But we can give folks advice on how to do that in, in the right way. I had a conversation with, um, third through fifth graders about the issue of privilege uh, and and what privilege means and and how you uh, attain it and how it's unearned <laughs> and kids got that you know they said yeah there are a lot of things that i have that i have not earned uh and uh and then we did sort of translate that over to talking about kind of white privilege and and they were able to make that shift pretty easily and then they were able to explain to me how in fact white privilege shows up in their lives, thank you, and how uh, it doesn't for their black uh, classmates and so on. Uh, and then we, and one of the reasons I went to that school to talk with them is because uh, the the N word had come up in um, a, a story that they were reading about Lewis and Clark. And Lewis and Clark are the people who supposedly discovered Oregon. Well, York was uh, an African man who was enslaved by them, who actually was more like a diplomat working with the native populations to help smooth the way essentially for uh, Lewis and Clark. And um, folks who encountered uh, York referred to York using the N-word. Um, and as we know, Oregon was a, was a state that um, it was not a slave state, but they wanted to make it easy for uh, slavers to come back and claim their slaves. And so, um, and they also excluded blacks from the state altogether. And so this story was being read in my son's class and he got very upset about the use of the N-word because it's not something he hears um, commonly. And uh, so the teacher asked me to come in and, and do an explanation around that. And so I started with the, the issue of privilege and white privilege and I incorporated music. And so I just made it a, uh, a an educational, but but also a fun experience for those students. And I, and I think that, that you and I, you know, have the backgrounds and others uh, who we work with uh, to be able to help, help folks figure out how to do that in a way that's gonna be you know, positive, but also um, intentionally educational and informative for students, parents, school, you know, educators and principals. So that, that's the thing I would say. I would also say to school leaders, you know, 50% of the population of public school students is, are students of color, right? And that's certainly the case in my district. And there, and there are many more districts where it's even more than that. So how do we deny black, brown uh, students and Asian Pacific Islander and indigenous students the opportunity, right, to see themselves in the curriculum? Uh, how, how do we continue to teach in ways that we know uh, are not effective with all populations, right? Uh, it, it's, it's, just, it's just not fair, it's not right. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, you, you went back to, uh, to Reagan earlier in terms of the, the, the push against equity and the inclusiveness. Uh, unfortunately, what that what that did was it uh, we failed an entire generation of kids, right? For whom, if their needs had been better met by schools, would have had all kinds of opportunities. And so, by denying 
uh, uh, teachers the opportunity to talk about race in the classroom, what you're doing is you are setting your students of color on a path to failure. I truly believe that. Um, I, I don't believe that our students are going to be the most successful that they can be when the curriculum is closed, when it's narrow, uh, and when it doesn't give students the opportunity to see themselves reflected and when their histories are denied and ignored. And so as an educator, that's a powerful statement to me. That's a powerful ethical moral statement that I think we have to pay attention to. Yeah, and um, I was going to say that it also prevents students from learning how to kind of have conversations across with people with different ideologies, right? Um, and it, you know, presumes that um, we all think the same. There's no kind of diversity of thought, which I think is really ironic. So in Florida, uh, DeSantis just, just signed this um, piece of legislation that requires higher ed in public institutions in Florida to um, staff and students have to, faculty and students have to complete a survey that's on intellectual diversity. And they have to, um, uh, they have to identify where they fit on a whatever, the, and, and the survey hasn't yet been done and they claim that they won't use the survey survey results to punish um, individual faculty or um, institutions, but it's not clear that that won't happen. Um, but I don't so even know how- they, they have they to make. identify their politics, Dr. Adrian? They have to yeah. identify what their politics yeah. are? Yeah. Yeah, see, that, that, I mean, that's McCarthyism. That's total McCarthyism yeah, right there. Yeah, and, and it's easy to game it. Like, if you know what I mean? So if you know that you're going to be punished, I'll just answer questions that align with what you think. Yes, I'm a fundamentalist. Yes, I believe this. Yes, I, you know what I mean? Like, if, if I have to game it, I'll just game it. Okay. And so what? You know, what? What's the end result? Yeah, yes. that, is, that is so anti-democratic. Well, closing thoughts, you know, I, I, I like where you ended up because what we're really talking about is two Americas, right? Uh, you know, if we, we we can live in an America where we are free to think what we'd like to think and believe, where we can study and practice uh, those things that, that truly we believe in, that 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 are, are, are part of um, our self-expression, right? And for me, that's what critical race theory is. It's, it's, it's a form of self-expression. It, it speaks to my experience. And so uh, it, 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 but it also has been wonderful to be in a, in a in a place where that's that's in fact expected. You are expected to be a free thinking individual. That that is what living in a quote unquote democracy is. Now we know that there have been many exceptions made, and there are many ways in which that has not been lived out of practice for us. But what we're talking about is that ideal, right? And that ideal is still very yeah. important. And so even yeah. as critical race theorists, we study race and we and we critique racism because we have this ideal of living in an anti-racist society, right? Uh, and 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 our and our role is to try to move us toward that goal. Uh, but to but to say we don't have the right to have to study these things, to talk about these things, to to think these things, to teach in these ways is fundamentally anti-democratic, and we might as well. Uh, you know, be in the USSR or something, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we, right? That is not that is not a democratic state. So if, we, if we're if we're thinking about if we want to live in a different type of system, I would say move someplace else, right? Uh, don't don't turn America into a dictatorship or or to some kind of authoritarian re regime where I have to put a, a lid on my intellect and 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 think like somebody else in order to, to survive. Uh, that is not freedom. Uh, and, right. and, and if you think that it, it's freedom because it's what you want, wait until the pendulum swings in the other direction, right? It, right. It's not gonna, it, it, will, it, will, it may start with critical race theory, but it won't stop there. Right. So we have to be very, very careful. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that um, it is hypocrisy at its highest to um, uh, talk about indoctrination 
and then you're indoctrinating people into espousing your beliefs and eradicating anything that doesn't fit within the paradigm that um, you have established. Um, I don't, so parting thoughts, I would say whatever you've heard about critical race theory in the mainstream, uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, at your local school board meeting is often inaccurate and <laughs> a misrepresentation of what critical race theory is. Um, if anything, I would say that no, it's, it's, there isn't a critical race theory K-12 curriculum that I'm aware of and I read a lot in the field. Um, so I don't know of any school district that's created a K-12 critical race theory curriculum. Um, but even if it did, I don't think that it would be um, what it's being cast as, as indoctrination, as anti-American, as, and as, as racist towards white people. All of that is a miss, is a distortion of what critical race theory is. So even if there was a critical race theory K-12 curriculum, it wouldn't do all of the things or any of the things that it is that, um, the detractors are accusing it of. And teachers who read critical race theory or follow critical race theory similarly are, um, as, as much as I understand it, they, they wouldn't as per the, the, the work, the scholarship that makes up critical race theory. Anything you wanna say on that, Marvin? And we'll be a deep. Well, you know, I think as we were discussing schools for a very, very long, time I've been struggling with how to teach all children in a way that responds to their needs, right? Uh, when your mentor, Dr. Goya Latson Billings, came out with that uh, that piece toward a toward a, a culturally toward a theory of culturally rele relevant teaching back in '95, she she documented the whole history, right? And this goes back to the '70s when we were talking about culturally responsive instruction, and culturally responsive pedagogy, because school was was a place of failure and continues to be for so many kids of color and so there's always been this struggle to figure out what can we do to make a difference right and and so there, there have been efforts underway way before critical race theory was a thing there were these efforts to try to make classrooms and schools more equitable spaces where everybody um, could learn and survive I would argue that the same movement has happened as you as you alluded to earlier around special education and all the laws that have been erected uh, as a way to ensure that we are including uh, kids who have special needs, intellectual needs, and so on. So this is this going, and and it needs and it must continue, uh, and and it has very little to do with the the grand theory that you and I work. Uh, it, uh, it in in critical race theory. I think what critical race theory can do is further sharpen how educators understand the nature of race and racism and how it impacts schools and, and society. You're to get sad, man. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, not at all. <laughs> guys, thank you guys for this amazing conversation. Uh, we truly appreciate it. We're about to move to part two of the show, but uh, thank you guys so much. Um, and if you guys want to come, because like this conversation was so dope. And if you want to come back and have part two of it, you're more than welcome to use our platform to, in order to be able to do so. But thank you so much uh, for this conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you all. All right. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you Bye. very much for having us. It was yeah. fun. Yeah.